Father, good afternoon. What a wonderful opportunity you continue to give us, allowing us to, to gather in your house with the body of Christ. We hunger for more and more of what it is you have to tell us, especially tonight as, as we look at one of the most misunderstood verses uh, in chapter 3 uh, in Scripture. So give us clarity, give us understanding. May your Spirit just give us what it is you want us to hear, what it is you want us to know. We just thank You that, that we can spend this time uh, in Your Word allowing You to speak. So may we hear that still, small voice as we search for the truth in Your Word. And may everything we learn and everything we do and say as a result bring glory to You in Your kingdom. And it's all in the name of Your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I will mention that we will not have class next Sunday night, Labor Day weekend. Several people are traveling, uh, so we will not meet next week. Uh, we will be back in two weeks uh, and move into chapter four. We are going to try to finish uh, chapter three tonight, and the lesson is nowhere near as long as last week. Uh, I had people asking me about, including our pastor, <laughs> who said he had heard the lesson was an hour and 45 minutes. And he's not here tonight, see? Uh, I know, I know that. Uh, he, and, and she's got it all right up here. So, Last week we ended with verse 15 of uh, chapter 3, uh, known as the first biblical promise uh, and prophecy uh, of the provision of salvation, if you recall. Uh, and that is called proto evangelium that really is the first gospel it starts right up front in the third chapter of genesis right after the fall god takes care of uh, salvation because of the sin and the fall of man now the rest of the book in fact the the whole old testament proceeds to point to that seed uh, Jesus Christ, He is the seed, singular. Uh, as explained at the end of class last week, uh, many believe that this is the first prediction of the virgin birth of Messiah. Uh, since it is specifically seed of the woman uh, and not the man that would crush the serpent. Uh, while verse 15 is said to be the first biblical promise uh, and prophecy regarding salvation, verse 16, which is where we start tonight, is said to be, as I said in the prayer, one of the most misunderstood verses in all of Scripture. Some believing this verse uh, is really judgment against woman, disciplining her uh, for her mistake. Uh, in the fall of man. So as I noted last week, I want to give you two different perspectives uh, and allow you to seek the Spirit's discernment uh, and wisdom. Several of you have spent uh, several hours looking online, searching between Google and Scriptures and commentaries, and, and there are just numerous interpretations of this passage where we're going to start tonight. Uh, but we're going to use God's Word and we're going to allow the Spirit to speak. That's what this whole course is about. It's not what Dean says or what somebody says. It's allowing the Spirit to talk and tell you the, the truth of His Word. Uh, in other words, just don't take uh, what I tell you uh, as the Gospel, so to speak. You do it on your own the way the Bereans did in the New Testament. Uh, reading chapter 16 of chapter 3, Moses writes what God says as He turns to woman after dealing with the serpent and after dealing with Satan, saying this, To the woman He said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Now, as already noted, complicated, misunderstood, because many of you have heard or have been taught that these are all judgments against the woman in discipline 
for her part in the fall, her mistake. Uh, as I'll explain in a few minutes, <clears throat> I don't think that's true. Uh, but when I read the commentaries I rely on, every one of them think that's true. I'm going to still give you the second one uh, in just a few minutes. But first, I want to give you the view that is that this is the judgment and the punishment against woman, uh, but understand right up front that neither Adam nor woman are cursed. We talked about that last week. Only the serpent uh, in verse 14, which is where we've been so far, and of course the earth and the soil that we will see in verse 17 are cursed because of man. Looking at the first phrase of verse 16 from the judgment perspective, you see it says, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children. The text does not say that God promised more conception as well as more pain, uh, even though the New King James translation uh, actually implies that. So if you've got a New King James, it actually adds some verbiage in there, but that's not in the Hebrew. Uh, because the, the King James, New King James says, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. Uh, the first part of her judgment here under this perspective is that maternity will be accompanied by suffering. Talking about your pains of pregnancy. A large family uh, was a sure sign of God's blessing in the Old Testament times, according to the Psalms and according to many other scriptures. But the pain of childbirth, uh, unrelieved by modern medicine, uh, was the most bitter known then. Uh, the bottom line here is that woman's joy in conceiving and bearing children would be turned to sorrow by the pain involved in it. Uh, and, and the commentaries say this is the first part of the judgment of woman because of her part in the fall. The second phrase adds, yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Uh, here it is more difficult to grasp uh, God's precise intention. Uh, there have been several interpretations of what woman's desire uh, would be. <clears throat> One, the phrase means that a woman's desire would be subject to her husband's desire. In other words, her desire, whatever it may be, would not be her own. Part of the punishment. She cannot do what she wishes for her husband rules over her. Secondly, <clears throat> it means that woman will have a great longing, a yearning, a psychological dependence even on her husband. No matter what, that's just innate in who she is, part of the curse. Thirdly, it means that the woman will desire to dominate the relationship with her husband. Uh, resting on the parallel Hebrew construction in Genesis 4 verse 7. I wasn't going to print that verse here because it deals with Cain and Abel, but I said I better go ahead and give it to you where you can understand how desire <coughs> could be misinterpreted here. In Genesis 4, verse 7, when, when Cain and Abel in that problem uh, and sin is crouching at the door waiting to control uh, Cain, Scripture says, If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, Cain, sin is crouching at the door. And here's where it comes into play. And its desire is for you but you must master it. So what this is saying is this is a desire to control sin, just to take over and control uh, Cain because of the, what he actually did. 
so we've got the same word for desire in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, yet your desire, and then we've got it in Genesis 4, verse 7. Those believing, verse 16, is judgment against woman. Uh, this third view uh, is probably the most widely accepted as it describes the beginning of the proverbial battle of the sexes, so to speak. Uh, after the fall, uh, man no longer rules easily. He must fight for his headship. Uh, the woman's desire is to control her husband, to usurp his divinely appointed headship, and he must master her if he can. Sin corrupt, corrupted both the willing submission of the wife and the loving headship of the husband. So, under an interpretation that sees verse 16 as judgment and discipline against woman, we see that the rule of love founded in the garden was replaced by struggle, tyranny, domination, and manipulation. We see a total change in woman as a result of the fall. Now, on the opposite side of the judgment discipline against woman belief, I believe that each case in Genesis 3.16 shows God's grace to woman because of what we've studied so far. And, and that is basically that God, that God has said woman was not culpable. Remember, uh, we studied that she was deceived by Satan while she was in a state of innocence not knowing good from evil. Scripture confirms this as we've already studied. We've looked at verses. He says, first, she will give birth to children in pain. Uh, it's obvious that pain is not what we want and as such can be seen as an obvious act of discipline uh, and we understand that. But remember how Scripture talks to the believer generally about struggles and pain and trial. We are to accept trials and tests as an opportunity to glorify God. That when we are sent to our death, we should give thanks for the fact that we might earn a crown through a faithful witness unto death. Uh, James chapter 1 uh, saying in verse 12, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. <clears throat> in truth, uh, Scripture's view of what pain or suffering looks like uh, is fundamentally different uh, from the way the world would teach pain. Uh, when women are called to suffer in childbirth, uh, we have to ask a question to what end before we really understand whether it in fact is meant as discipline or something greater. Uh, one of the commentaries I use suggests that the pain becomes a memorial in the woman's body <clears throat> as a reminder of the pain God Himself must endure on our behalf when He goes through the process of birthing new life in Christ, what it cost Him. That process of new birth through the faith that we have in Christ's death will be a painful process for God. Uh, he must now experience pain on His own part to make up for the sin of man. Uh, but the result of that pain is a glorious new birth. That's the result. 
<clears throat> in John 16, verse 21, he says, Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain, because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Verse 22, Therefore, you too have grief now, speaking of the time in which he would die. But I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. Women carry in their body a small reminder, a small version, though painful, of the work God did on the cross. Though this is chastisement in one sense, I think like all good chastisement, it's grace. Ultimately, the woman is being told that she will be given the privilege of giving birth to Messiah. Next, woman will have a desire for her husband and he will rule over her. Uh, what a misunderstood verse. Uh, the, the word here for desire in Hebrew, you see it on the right, teshuka. And it only appears in two places in Scripture. It appears in Genesis twice, in our verse 16, in Genesis 4, verse 7, dealing with Cain, that desire, and in the Song of Solomon, in chapter 7, verse 10. In the Song of Solomon, this desire is a sexual longing, which obviously is what the whole point of the book is. So despite what we see about Cain's desire for sin in Genesis 4, looking at the relationship between husband and wife, Song of Solomon, and in chapter 3 of Genesis, the natural way to interpret the word desire here seems to be exactly the same way uh, it, it is done in the Song of Solomon. Uh, look at what God has just given woman a desire for her husband. Unfortunately, many people today have twisted this into the desire or longing for woman to rule over man, over her husband, using the second half of the verse as a way to justify a, a fight. They see it uh, as if God has created this fight by giving woman a desire to rule while telling man in the last part of the verse, try to correct it. You must rule over her. So you see the conflict set up if we look at it that way. Uh, that interpretation, I think, flies in the face of Scripture and in effect would make God uh, the author of sin. I just don't think He would set anybody up to accomplish that. Uh, scripture is clear that God is neither the author of sin nor does He bring us to temptation to sin. So it cannot, to me, mean that woman is given a desire to rule over her husband. However, several of the commentaries I use in preparing for this study are, are polar opposites of what I have just suggested. Uh, I encourage you spend some time in this passage. Many of you already have and already know uh, which way the Spirit is leading, leading you. Uh, but meditate, pray for discernment by the Spirit uh, before accepting my interpretation as correct. I just have to be real careful. Uh, but, but I anguished in reading these two verses and read commentaries. And the one I go to the most is the one I don't like. It's just not, I just don't, I think he's wrong. And, and he's some brilliant guy, I'm sure, out there. And I'm just a layman. I, I've not studied any of this. But, but the Spirit speaks to all of us in different ways. And I think he will do the, the same to you and give you an interpretation. Uh, based on this interpretation of Genesis 3.16, the natural meaning is that woman has a desire for her husband. And in concert with that, he has a role of watching over, protecting, guiding, and leading her. 
the critical issue here uh, to me is the unity of the family in the face of sin. The two shall become one, is what it says. Not two or not three. Uh, they're getting ready. Think about the, the scenario here at the end of chapter 3. They're getting ready to be put outside the garden. And when they're outside the garden, God knows they're going to face the enemy. Big time. Forevermore, the enemy is going to be prowling around in the world because he has gained dominion for a time because of the triumph in the garden. And the only defense they have is the family unit to me. And the, and the best thing God can give that unit is a strong marriage relationship where the two become one you know, in the Lord. A woman who desires her husband and a man who will take care of the woman. A woman goes largely unpunished except that she will share in the punishments handed to Adam, remember. And we'll really cover that as we finish chapter 3 because by her being taken out of man's side, uh, that means Adam was made from dirt, from the ground. She came out of his side flesh so God can accomplish this purpose of putting both of them uh, outside of the garden instead of just one. Let's move now to verse 17. Uh, God reserves His longest statement for Adam regarding the sin in the garden. Now in view of Adam's sin, we might have expected God to curse him. He really, all right, if we're going to attribute all this to man and to him, he, he probably is going to get it. But graciously, God cursed the ground for his sake. So let's move into verses 17, 18, and 19 of chapter 3. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread, till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you were dust, and to dust you shall return. Familiar passage. God begins His statement to Adam by saying, Adam listened to his wife's voice. I wrote here, whoa. You know, most of us men have been told from time to time, that's not a bad thing. Right? And in fact, may be criticized when we don't listen to our wife. But in this context, you need to understand, it's not so much that it's bad to listen to your wife, but in this situation, it's by comparison the wrong thing for Adam to have done when it's opposite of what God has commanded. The comparison is obvious in the text. He should have just listened to God's voice, right? That was the problem. As a general rule, and it goes both ways, a husband should take the counsel of his wife Unless, of course, it flies in the face of God's counsel. And the opposite is true uh, when the husband's counsel to his wife is contrary to God's counsel. Though she is to be under his headship, the headship of the husband biblically. Uh, bottom line, always follow God. Uh, that's always the expectation for man and woman. Uh, in this case, we notice Adam did not hear God's voice, uh, but just the woman's voice, uh, much to his own regret, obviously. But also notice he's not accused of having listened to the serpent's voice either, or, or Satan's voice here. Uh, 
That's important because it reminds us that man was not eavesdropping on the conversation between woman and Satan. He was not influenced by anything the serpent said to the woman in their conversation. There's nothing in the text to suggest that. As some commentaries will tell you that he was standing right there by her side. Some have used the fact in the text that Adam is seen to be near her physically in that moment that she took, ate, and then handed the fruit to Adam. But, but if you dig here and look, that's going a little bit too far because the text doesn't imply any linkage in time. It's just linkage in cause and effect. She hears the snake, she eats, she hands the fruit to Adam. Uh, it could easily have been gaps of time between those three moments, minutes, uh, hours, right? There's nothing to require that it happen with all three present standing right there. She's standing there, he's standing there, the snake's standing there. She bites and says, here, here you go that's the way we read it sometimes. That's just not there. There's nothing to require that it happen with all three present. And the text makes it clear here that he's, his blame is because he heard her voice and did as she told him to do. Not that he heard the serpent's or Satan's voice and did like Satan suggested. So we have to think about this. You know, I can do something, somebody can say, well, how did that happen? Well, I went so and so, and I did so and so, and then I went to Beverly, who was at home, and I told her, and she did it. Oh, well, y'all weren't together. No, 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 we weren't together. I mean, we can come up with the scenario reasonably, and the text didn't put it there, so it's not like they're standing side by side. And I think it's important to realize that his blame is because, he says right there in verse 17, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and eaten, I'm going to curse the ground. Therefore, we come to this conclusion. Adam was responsible for what he did and so he is the one Scripture credits for bringing sin into the world. The woman was innocent. Didn't know good from evil. Satan deceived her. It's like we talked last week about deceiving a, a three-year-old child. We can certainly deceive our three-year-old grandchild and tell him, that's okay, Reynolds, you can do that. Okay, just roll right on. You know, he, he, he was deceived. He wasn't deceived as far as it goes to Adam. He made a choice. He listened to two voices. God, woman. He chose the wrong one. Right? So in response to Adam's sin, God now issues the second curse, which by the way, uh, is the only other one. We can look at chapter 3. Uh, somebody said, oh yeah, that's the one with all the curses of God, right? I said, well, yeah. Technically, there are two. Oh, no, no, there are no, they're two, right? It's not one curse after another, after another, after another, as some people mistakenly believe, uh, which he just threw out at everyone involved. Uh, the only curse up until now has been Satan. Right? Satan. And now, as we turn to man who is cursed, he says, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten, cursed is the ground. Not man. God does not curse Adam at this point. So neither woman nor Adam are cursed. And that's important for their role in the fall in the garden. Instead, God curses the ground. Uh, and specifically, what He has said in the course of verses 17, 18, and 19 is that the earth itself is deemed to be irreparable. 
Remember, we defined a curse several weeks ago. A curse means that the object of the curse will cease to be in some context. Uh, by this curse, God declared that the earth must be replaced. The earth is no longer considered suitable for eternity because Adam's sin has become a contaminant, if you will. Remember, Adam was made from the earth. So when Adam fell by walking into sin knowingly, walking into sin knowingly and choosing to sin, the earth itself became contaminated by that sin as well. Adam's physical body is no different from God's point of view from a tree or an animal which all came from the earth. So God has now declared the earth as a result of this curse will deteriorate over time, wear out, and eventually be destroyed and replaced. We, we spent a, last week. The, the bottom line is because she was in a state of innocence, Scripture tells us, yeah. and she was deceived. That is a defense in Scripture. She is not culpable for listening to the serpent and choosing to eat the apple. Adam, on the other hand, that's why it says to curse through one man. It doesn't say through one woman. So woman was not culpable, was not guilty. Her guilt is imputed because she comes out of the side of man. That's, and that's also why she's innocent? Or not, not, not guilty? No, because she, she was, she's not culpable, meaning she was tricked. She was deceived. Of course, because she was deceived. That's exactly right, yes. She didn't sin here. That's why well, you have to be careful when you look at verse 16 of chapter 3 at the punishment. One, the way I'm telling you, it's grace. He's going through because he knows what they're going to face outside. And the other one is she's punished by all this hard labor, but her desire, her longing, her craving to rule over her husband. you know, All part of the punishments. But no woman from this perspective is innocent. Because remember, up until Adam ate the apple, they didn't know the difference between good and evil. There was no difference. That's why she was purely in a state of innocence. Once Adam ate the apple, you know, then their eyes were open. Then they decided to go make some, you know, fig leaf shorts and, and walk around. Yeah. Okay. Wow. We need to write that down, don't we? Many believe that this is the origination of the second law of thermodynamics. Now, I, I don't, you know what thermodynamics is. That is, the effect of the curse brings it into play. And, and the bottom line is, the law simply says, all matter and energy go from a higher state of organization to a lower state, never the reverse. Over time, look at the earth. Deteriorating, deteriorating, deteriorating. Our bodies, deteriorating. deteriorating. We're not going the other way as we get older. I heard several comments tonight, I'm just older. I'm just old. Maybe it was old they were saying. But you know, <clears throat> That's the second law of thermodynamics. Materials over time wear out, right? They wear out. They go from higher levels to lower levels, never the other direction. This is where this all seems to have start. Because remember, when these bodies were made, these are eternal bodies, made to live forever, except for the sin. How long did Adam live after he took a bite of the apple? 930 years. Finally wore out. He finally died. All right. Uh, in Isaiah 34, verse 4, the prophet said this, 
and all the host of heaven will wear out, and the sky will be rolled up like a scroll. All their host will also wither away as a leaf withers from the vine, or as one withers from the fig tree. <clears throat> it all started here in the garden. Second Peter 3, uh, taking that principle and applying it more specifically in verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to His promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Peter's appreciation here is that as men and women who know the truth of Scripture, our attitude should be, this world's going away. I don't need to invest a whole lot here. We certainly don't want to place our hope in things of this world. It's destined to be burned up. It's going to be replaced. And it is already being slowly destroyed, slowly, slowly, according to what Isaiah said. It's just going to wear out like we do. Look at what God is doing here because there's a subtlety uh, that I just don't think we want to miss here when we do the digging the way we do. First, uh, the effect it had on Adam. Think about this. Before the curse, Adam is told to go to work the ground in the garden and serve God. And remember how we talked about that? It would be a, an enjoyable and a rewarding kind of work. In fact, it, it wasn't work at all in the way we think of work today. It would have been service to joy with none of the toil, struggle, the difficulty that we commonly associate with work today. Now, think about after the curse. His efforts to work the ground will be a chore, a fight against this decree God has instituted. Work will be two steps forward, one step back kind of experience. God's curse guarantees that if you plant a garden, weeds are going to show up. Yard work, not going to be fun in the sense that it's not going to last. You go out there and redo your whole yard tomorrow or the next day, you got to do it again, right? If you put a fence up, it's going to deteriorate and fall down. Things will wear out. Things are going to need repainting, rebuilding, remodeling. That's toil. That's fruitlessness. That's frustration. That's the nature of how this curse affected Adam and everyone after Adam. It had an immediate effect on how things work in this world. Whereas before the curse... Adam's work didn't include these kind of setbacks. It was just a joy. Where are you going? Going to work. Doesn't get any better than this. Wow. All right? So why does God curse the ground? I mean, why the ground? First, like woman's pain, it is a chastisement that also forms a memorial of the mistake. He'll remember this. We remember this while we're working the way we work today. Uh, today we can remember how sin led to this situation. Uh, the object lesson teaches us the futility of working in the face of sin. Here we sit, August the 28th, 2022, uh, talking about something that happened thousands of years ago. That's the memorial. It, it's sort of 
embedded in our minds. Uh, how long can you garden to create a perfect garden that never falls apart? You can't in this world. Hadn't you tried? Perfect. That first day, oh my goodness. You just sit back and say, wow. This is unbelievable. It, it doesn't last. You, you can't do it in the world. Second, this change becomes an object lesson to teach us the futility of man's work in the face of sin. Our flesh wants to solve its own problem we are tempted to work out our own solution, right? But now man's fruitless efforts at work will serve as a contrast to God's perfect work in Jesus Christ. We can't simply rely on our own work because our work is never finished. When we pull a weed, we go back tomorrow, there's another one. All right? When we paint the house, we have to paint it again in a few years. Whatever we do does not last long. Finally, the curse will ensure that God eventually puts an end to everything contaminated by sin. This is the origin of physical death for everything that comes out of the ground. Adam's body, animals' bodies, trees, plants. It's the wisdom of God to create a plan where He can curse the contaminated world without cursing Adam's spirit. It's just his physical body. These bodies are eternal our spirit is eternal. Only the physical body is cursed by this pronouncement, which is why we must receive a new body upon our resurrection. People would return to dust when they died according to verse 19, rather than living forever, experiencing physical immortality the way Adam was created, people would now die physically and experience physical mortality. I, I need to point out the Genesis 3.19 verse does not attribute the cause of death to the original construction of the human body. Because some people have said, yeah, but man would have ultimately died anyway, right? I mean, that's the body is going to be returned to dust. The, 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 this states that one of the consequences of sin is death. I mean, Adam lived 930 years. What are you going to be doing when you're 500 years old? You know, When you're 800 years old? We, we don't face that. Since the human body was formed from the dust of the earth, it shall upon death be resolved to earth again. Verse 18 shows the reversal of the land's condition before and after the fall. Verse 19 shows the same for mankind's condition. See verse 18, thorns and thistles, it'll grow for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you'll eat bread till you return to the ground. Wow. Yet this curse is ultimately a blessing to God's children here. Man's corrupt body must be replaced. And because woman was made from man, not from the ground, she shares in these same pronouncements. If not, man would live forever eternally sinful. The psalmist in Psalm 102, verse 24 says this, I say, O oh my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days. Your years are throughout all generations. 
Of old you founded the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you endure. And all of them will wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. The children of your servants will continue and their descendants will be established before you. This is what happened in this short section of Scripture with Adam. It's the testimony of Scripture. Think about how much human history was established in those three verses. Genesis 3, 17, 18, and 19. Look at what happened here from a human perspective. What do you see? Physical death. Right? The necessity of God replacing the entire heavens and earth with a new heavens and a new earth. And in the meantime, the nature of all things was established with all things wearing out. Going from better to worse, everything falls apart. You know, we, we take that for granted today, don't we? Aging, disease, here it all is. He just lines it up for us. Look at what the prophet writes in Isaiah 65, verse 21 and 2, that a day will come when God will restore this world in a new way. And he talks about the fact that things in that new world, they're going to be a little bit different. They will build houses and inhabit them. They will also plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build and another inhabit. They will not plant and another eat. For as the lifetime of a tree, so will be the days of my people. And my chosen ones will wear out the work of their hands. No physical death. No building something only to have it wear out. Somebody need to repair it or sell it or somebody else get to enjoy it after you're gone. The work of your hands will fully mature into an eternity of fruit. Wow! Then the chapter wraps up with a number of significant details and additional effects on Adam and woman. Reading verses 20 and 21. Now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. The Lord gave, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. I, I found this interesting. Uh, we've been calling woman, woman for what three chapters here. And all of a sudden, Adam changes her name. Uh, it seems the story has sort of abruptly changed course. And this, we're expecting to read more and more about the fall and what's happening. And then all of a sudden, this sort of comes out of nowhere uh, in light of what God has just told Adam. Uh, you, you'd think his first response might have been to what God said uh, and did instead of getting distracted and naming his wife. Or to me. I mean, he's just been told you're going to work all your life, you're going to die, the earth's going to be gone, you're going to grow briars and thorns, and nothing's going to last, and your body's going to wear out. Well, I'm going to name my wife. I think I'm going to call her just... Now, that's just me. It just seems odd to me. But, but we see God making garments for Adam and his wife, clothing them. Adam and Eve accepted their judgment from God and did not rebel or argue or fight Him over passing judgment. Uh, of course the points here are related. I'm being a little facetious here because there's a reason God did it this way. There's a reason we're reading it in what Moses wrote. So let's take a moment to sort of understand how this fits together if those thoughts came across your mind. First, Adam here is renaming his wife. 
Some have misunderstood this and thought that because she didn't have a name, he said, you know, all we've been through is about time to name this woman. Uh, but, but that's not true because he had already given her a name. Remember where we've been and studied? Back in chapter 2, verse 23, the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. That was her name. Woman. Uh, don't try to call your wife that. Woman, come here. All right? That name was changed, wasn't it? Okay? And does the translation say that means woe to man? But now, Adam decides to rename woman to Eve. Why? Why is this renaming happening? Why did Adam decide to do it here in the midst of all these life-changing moments? I mean, there's a lot going on here in these verses, and he stops and renames his wife. I'll give you... All right, he's changing her name, right? Why? Literally in Hebrew, the name Eve means mother of all living. Uh, the, the, the Hebrew word here is kaval, C-H-A-V-V-A-H, pronounced kaval. Uh, and it literally means life or living. Uh, the first woman. Her name tells us why Adam has renamed her and why he did it here. If you've paid attention to what God has said, Adam just heard God declare that woman, that God would bring a solution to the problem through. Woman, the solution would result in the destruction of the servant, remember the enmity, and it would come through a seed that woman would provide. Now, this solution, later to be called the Messiah, would be the source of all the living in a truly spiritual sense. So God hears, Adam hears God make this promise. And he takes action in response. I think what he's done, he's learned to listen to God. You know, I messed up one time, but I'm not going to do it again. The word God spoke said woman would bring new life. He hasn't given any birth yet. Not yet. But... We're going there because that is the whole key underlining in everything here. So God spoke and said about the seed through woman. So He renames her Eve, meaning life or living. And what does that tell us? Adam is showing proof that he received this word from God. And what? And believed it. Wow! We know God had spoken to Adam before concerning the tree. Don't eat from the tree. Anything else, don't, don't eat this one. Adam, eh, pff, not listening. Don't believe that word. So sin comes into the world. But the fall of man brings us a troubling question. If Adam didn't believe God's word, was Adam saved? Did you wonder about that? In other words, did he receive grace and become saved from the sin he produced? Well, here, God gives us the answer. Having heard God's promise concerning his wife, Adam believed God's Word this time. In fact, he renames his wife to make it clear he believes. 
Absolutely. This is what it is. He showed faith in God's Word. This is also a direct reversal of the last time when he heard a Word of God, didn't believe, acted contrarily. Now, he acts in keeping with belief and he takes an action consistent with his belief in faith. Just like you said, woman hadn't had any babies and hadn't given birth, yet he still believed and stepped out in faith purely because of what God said. So in this moment, we can say that Adam becomes a believer by faith in God's Word. In response to that faith, God demonstrates that forgiveness is available. You believe what I said. You step out relying without any hard evidence or any facts. Uh, look at what He does. God makes Adam and Eve animal skins for clothes. Does that seem odd to you? It did to me. Apparently the fig leaf shorts they previously made were insufficient as they apparently tried to cover themselves with, with plants, right? That covering was not enough. They felt vulnerable. We saw that. He hid himself. We had that discussion last class. And now by faith, God grants them a covering made of animal skins. Yes. Sure, death. This means that animals had to die to provide their skins. Unless there was something we don't know. I don't know how in the world you can take the blood and take the animal skin off the animal and the animal will not die. An animal was sacrificed to provide, look at this, this is an amazing picture, to provide a covering for man, both physical and spiritual. The atonement was a picture of the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross. All the way back here in Genesis 3. Where before, man tried to cover himself by his own work, in making fig leaves out of plants, God says, not enough. You can't do it on your own, through your hands, through your work. That work is insufficient to provide the true covering for sin that only I, God, can provide. Uh, the bottom line seems to be that Adam had to learn that sin could not be covered by a bunch of leaves snatched from a tree as he passed by and that would grow again next year. Only by pain, death, and blood. It gives me chills. Just, I, I, it's amazing. Gleason Archer uh, is a commentary that, that I pick up occasionally. In, in his biblical encyclopedia, Gleason Archer expands this, writing that he thought it reasonable to assume that when God provided animal skins for Adam and Eve to wear, that He also... God instructed them about the significance of the atoning blood of the substitute sacrifice. Uh, he also believed that they passed this understanding on to Cain and Abel. Uh, of course, there is no way to prove or disprove this theory in Scripture, but it just makes sense. I mean, how did they find out? How, you know, did God speak to every one of them? So this commentary says, I just think it makes sense for, you know, for God to sort of explain it to His first two children here, the atoning blood of the substitute sacrifice. So, in faith, Adam finds a true covering because he believed with no proof, no evidence. And notice again that God provides animal skins by His own hands. Reminding us again 
God's work can do what man's work cannot. God's work can do what man's work cannot. Uh, this is the first death, like you said, recorded in the history of creation. An animal sacrificed to cover the first sin. We call that limited atonement, don't we? Not permanent, not going to last forever. Still got to be a big one down the road. But this is that limited atonement. Moving now to the final verses as we wrap up this chapter 3. Genesis 3 verse 22. We read this. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Now first we immediately notice here in verse 22 that God uses a plural when referring to Himself. Did you see that? Man has become like one of us. I said, oh my goodness, what a simple way to see that even in the first pages of the Bible, God refers to Himself as the Godhead. Saying, man has become like one of us. I looked up the word in Hebrew. <laughs> and the word here is Elohim. You've heard of that word, right? It's the word in Hebrew being the plural reference to God. So I looked up, I said, Elohim is plural? It sure is. It's Eloah or something, the, the singular. But So Elohim is more than one. It's clearly the, the Trinity on display. Now some of the commentaries say, no, 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 that's not right. I see it plain as day when he talks about like one of us. This statement is a comment by God, I think for the benefit of mankind explaining why we, man, were excluded from the garden God made available. Verse 22 shows that man's happiness, his, his good, if you will, does not consist in his being like God as much as it depends on his being with God. Remember, he walked with God in the garden. That's the privilege he lost, to be with God, not to be like God. Uh, this is a, a picture to me of God's grace in, in, in two ways. It's grace to provide for the replacement of this corrupted, contaminated body. It's grace to ensure that men aren't left alive to be used by Satan indefinitely in a corrupted, sinful body for eternity, eternity, to live forever under the curse. By forcing them out of the garden, the man and woman will know physical death. But this is a good thing for believers in the end now, right? Secondly, God must prevent Adam and Eve from entering God's presence in the garden again. Though they are saved by faith, nevertheless, they still carry around sin in their bodies. We are saved, but we are sinful. Uh, this sin cannot be in the presence of a just and a holy God and live. So God drives them out, they are expelled from the garden. We talked about that if they came face to face accidentally with God in that condition that would have been an immediate judgment, an immediate curse against sin resulting in their death. The sense in Hebrew is that they weren't necessarily willing to leave the garden. 
but God used His angels to sort of force them out. And to be sure they didn't try to slip back in and re-enter, God stations cherubim at the entrance and this flaming sword. Uh, this must have been a dramatic scene for, for many years. I thought about that and I asked y'all earlier, how long did Adam live after this? 930 years. Uh, this guard would have been in place for 1,630 years until the flood. Can you imagine what what's that, Mom? The garden. This was grace in that it preserved the human race uh, to ensure God's plan of redemption would have time to play out as God intended instead of coming to an untimely end by meeting God head on in judgment in the garden. Zap, over. Oh, got to start all over again. Wow. Cherubim in the Old Testament, by the way, surround and symbolize God's presence uh, being the equivalent to, uh, somebody said, they're sort of like God's bodyguards. All right? Standing guards, sentries. Uh, ancient uh, iconography pictured them as human headed wing lions guarding holy places. Yes. Yes, they were. Absolutely. Matter of fact, remember Satan himself was the cherubim. He was the chief one. He's the one that guarded the holy of the holies over God's glory. All right. uh, Moses pictured them here blocking access to the tree of life with a flaming sword. Evidently, eating of the tree of life would have caused Adam and Eve to stop aging. Just like he says up there in the verse. I mean, he may slip back in here and take this from the tree of knowledge and live forever. We cannot allow him to have a forever sinful body. The reference to the flaming sword is seen to be a reference to the Shekinah glory of God Himself. So God uses angels and His glory to keep men out of the garden after the fall. Before Adam enjoyed this direct one on one fellowship with God. But now sin had produced this barrier that prevented him from having that intimate, personal relationship with the Creator of the universe, God Himself, in the garden. The barrier was obvious and foreboding in the form of angels and God's glory. Yeah. Well, it said here God provided that for them. Yeah. Ab absolutely. But see, what he was doing was showing us that God can take this, this atoning, this limited atonement, and not only cover you physically, but also cover you spiritually because of your sinful nature. That's why God got involved. He said, you just got fig leaves. You just jerk leaves off of a tree. Not going to work. But then God did it. And I don't know how long those lasted. I don't know if they lasted forever or not. Or if... You know, because we don't read about them going out killing animals to make new clothes or new shoes or whatever. But God took care of them, yes. Remember, no class next week for Labor Day weekend. We'll be back two weeks on the 11th and we will move into chapter 4. Let's pray, please. Lord, thank You. Thank you. Thank you for opening our eyes tonight. We've read these verses. We've seen them. We've misunderstood them along with everybody else. Even the commentaries that we search out diligently or disagree. Uh, but Father, Your Word is infallible. It's inerrant. You have given us the Holy Spirit to help us discern truth. So that's what we pray for. We pray for Your nudging. We pray for Your clarity and understanding and wisdom as we go back through this lesson, as we read these verses, may you speak 
in an area that we clearly just don't understand. Uh, we are in awe of You. You alone are worthy of our worship and our praise. And we thank You that we've got the privilege to sit here at Your feet, dig into Your Word, and allow You to speak to each one of us. Uh, to You be the glory, Father. And we thank You for what You're doing and what You're going to do through this study and through these people. And it's all in the name of Your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.